Um, so I, I'll give a um, highlight of a project that I'm part of in Europe. It's a Horizon 2020 project where we look at uh, cloud-based services and the, my uh, institute's uh, part of it is uh, providing the GPU-based uh, services. Um, so a little bit of who I am. I've actually been in this field for quite some time. Actually programmed concurrent Pascal and Perel Pascal back in the 80s. Uh, the nice thing to note is that when we, I was in grad school, we were very excited to have a total of one gigabyte of memory. And now we have that on the smartphones. Actually, we have more than that on our smartphone, probably. Um, and we just, we just thought that was awesome. Um, I was also part of the MPI one and two efforts as a graduate student and later at Schlumberger. So that's some of my background. Um, what I really need to thank, though, you know, as a professor, you, you, you teach people parallel computing, get them excited, uh, get them involved, but sometimes the students are teaching you. And in this case, as far as how I got into GPUs, is this really the case? I had two very brilliant students, um, Christian Larsen and Erik Alks Nielsen, who in the fall of 2000 came to me and wanted me to buy them a GPU card, and everybody else in my department told me I was just being wrapped around their little fingers because how could I spend half my discretionary budget on this toy that's really used for games? And, and they thought, didn't think we were serious. You know, they were just laughing at us. This is before CUDA. Uh, they had a program in CG. And they did this really awesome projects, one with utilizing GPU on cluster computers. And the other one, Eric Axe Nilsson, he actually did a wavelet transform for the GPU that was so impressive that G Health here and others, later you, now you know, all use GPUs, but because we got a 40x speed up, and it was just a very impressive thing. And of course, since then, we've um, used GPUs a lot. In fact, you can see why, because actually I was a, a head of computational sciences uh, at NTNU uh, back in 2006, and we just bought what we thought was an awesome supercomputer at seven teraflops, right? Well, the Tesla P100 is in that range, right? So now you have <laughs> basically a one U little uh, uh, rack mountable blade that you can get the same kind of performance out of. We've since, of course, uh, been in GPU computing. In fact, I was on the sup um, tutorial committee on supercomputing in 2007. Uh, and people told us when they, they saw the NVIDIA tutorial is that, oh, it's industry stuff. They, they, they would just be like a commercial. They didn't want to accept it. And I fought for it, and for many years, it was the hottest uh, tutorial at SC. And I think, I like to think that I had influence in getting to, you know, a little part of elite influence in getting to where we are today by, you know, fighting for it. And it was all due to those students who got me so excited about GPUs in, back in 2008, uh, 2006. Um, whoa, what happened to that one? Something happened. Anyway. Um, I'll be giving you some audit, there's something with the formatting. Hope this is not going to do be typical of this. Um, I was talking about uh, the use cases for oil and gas that we'll be using for this Horizon uh, 2020 project after giving you an overview of the project itself. Uh, we'll get some, we also have a use case on optimized libraries. Uh, we have then their, the t how we tested them, the test bed we did, and then research registration plugins and telemetry plugins. Um, and then what we do on the do beyond. So now first a little overview of the Cloud Lightning project itself. So the Cloud Lightning project has eight partners, European partners. It's led by UCC, which is in Cork, Ireland. Uh, we're the second largest partner, at least in the budget wise. Also Institute of Aust uh, Austria to Maswara, which is in Romania, is a major partner. Uh, there's, they have more people, but they're cheaper. <laughs> they have cheaper, so they have more. <laughs> so they don't have less budget. And then we also have Greek partners which are doing the simulations. Uh, the CERT, which is um, well known in the EU circles, and then DUTH, which is the actual uni as a university uh, that helps out. And DCU in Dublin uh, does sort of the management and um, also the commercialization part efforts. And then we have two industrial partner, Maxler, which is known for FPGA-based uh, data flow engines, as well as Intel Ireland. Um, and they are represented through the Xeon Phi efforts. Here are some of the faces that um, you saw in the group picture. You can see my, uh, oops, wrong button. Too much button. Here's my, my people from H NTNU. Uh, you can see some of the people from Timisoara. There are actually more people than the, these two involved, um, our main partners. And then the people from Surth and Duth. 
uh, and again, Intel, Maxler, uh, and DCU. So it's funded under Horizon 2020. For those who are not familiar with Europe, that's one of the biggest funding uh, efforts inside of Europe is this Horizon 2020 program. And inside there, you have both the ERC, which is sort of an NSF, and as well as major other uh, computing-related and other research-related projects. Um, we got then funded from February 2015, and it will go on to 2018. So this is not a complete project. This is ongoing. So I'm describing ongoing work, just so that it's clear. And the aim for this project is to develop infrastructures, methods, and tools for high-performance adaptive cloud applications and services that go beyond the current capabilities. So we're trying to do something that you know, cannot do, at least uh, so far. Although there are lots of parallel efforts, so I'm sure there are some aspects that are already done elsewhere. That, that, that's natural with any bigger project. I'm trying to get this to click. Uh, this is a very busy slide, but it, it came from the call, and you look at the call talking about heterogeneity of resources, like, yes, you have the Amazon cloud, you can lo you know, ask for a set of GPUs, but you know, you sort of have to ask for it yourself. It's not transparent, right? You know, like, I know I'm going to use GPUs, so I log in and get GPUs. What we're trying to do is, let's just say we have them as a service, just like in the cloud thinking. So I have an application I want to run. It's implemented both on a GPU, uh, Xeon Phi, maybe a bunch of SMPs, and then the cloud service mechanism will then pick which platform to use based on either power criteria, timing criteria, utilization criteria, and some, some kind of these criteria that are, are hiding from the cloud. So we don't, so we're ha of course the back end, you have to have them implemented. Uh, and you have to have them implemented in a certain way to make this work. Um, and this comes from, you know, the, the fact is, the reason GPUs are so popular and continue to be so popular is they are very power efficient even for HPC applications because they are so targeted to doing if you can get your application to utilize the GPU well, and it doesn't work well for absolutely all problems, and then we certainly have banging our heads doing instruction problems on them right now. But you know, if when you can get your application to work, and the fact that on the GTX card today, high-end one, you have over 3,600 cores, you know, that's a whole lot of cores, even if you seemingly use a lot of watts, but it's nothing like the KSR machine <laughs> with one megabyte, gigabyte of memory and 128 cores, right? That was, that was a monster, right? So th it's very energy efficient, and we know that. Um, to say a little bit more about the cloud um, project and what it actually does, so the self-organizing, self-management system, that actually this, uh, kicks in at the scale, right? So if you, the test, little test bit I'm talking about in our efforts, we don't really do that particular part of the project. There's a lot of, uh, you know, efforts that goes into doing uh, a special uh, mechanism for doing the self-organization. Uh, but we look, more look at the resource allocation and down at the more sort of low-level uh, part of the project. So for resource allocation, we actually looked at both bare metal, VM, and containers. And you know, I kind of predicted this ahead of time, but we really convinced ourselves and our partners that if you want to do HPC on a cloud, you should use containers. And they just work so much better, especially for complex uh, application. If you have anything but a simple application, just a software stack involved, I mean, installing uh, MPI on a NumaScale machine, which is an SMP, you know, to get the right you know, libraries on top of that, and then put um, the applications on top of the libraries again, and you ha basically have several layers of libraries, you're going to be in trouble if you could try and virtualize them just a few uh, on bare metal, I th I'm, I'm telling you. Because we, we spent uh, several days, almost a week, just in tuning our MPI install, right, and, and with the libraries and getting them all to work together. So there are issues that people don't like to talk about, but these are real. <laughs> And so when you want to do things in the cloud, you have to be aware of that. Um, so we think, by far, containers are the most realistic option for HPC workloads. Um, the resources in the cloud model is divided into cell, which is then based on region allocation. Because let's face it, sending data across an interna uh, 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 internet to a different site 
is actually expensive, right? If you think it's expensive of the PCI Express bus or Envilink, it's definitely expensive to send it over to a data center on the other side of you know, the country or city, whatever. So it's got to be some kind of regional location uh, uh, of consideration when you're trying to move data, right? Otherwise, you're just going to have be in trouble. And each cell may have different hardware types. So you may have a GPU-based system, um, a Xeon-based system, some of MIX and DFEs are the ones we're containing. And then we partition those again into virtual racks or V-racks that, you know, presumably have the same type. Now, you know, it's a little bit stretched. I know people will say, well, any GPU also has to have a CPU. So, you know, in that sense, they're two different ones. But, we, you know, we consider those the same type, okay, in quote. Um, and then how you do, in, do the resource utilization, you look a little more about the self-optimized uh, part. And there are different ways of provisioning, and I won't go into that detail here since I want to have some time to actually explain uh, the other um, parts of the system. So to get a sort of picture view of it, we're concentrating on the homog heterogeneous resources provided uh, at this site. You can add new hardware <coughs> through plug and play services. It all feeds into the self-organization, self-management system that then provision <coughs> the applications for that will be running as a service. So we picked three main use cases. Um, the European funding agencies are very concerned about the, having good use cases and showing that the technology you develop actually works. And this use case that NTNU or my university is c c uh, part of is <coughs> the oil and gas. It's, and you may not be surprised, right? Norway is known for its oil fields. So um, it's not surprising that my group has some experience with it. In fact, we collaborated with both Statoil, Schlumberger, and other uh, smaller oil field companies, and so we have experience in this area. So we picked that as one of them. And of course, if you can improve your modeling for oil and gas, that can, you know, the similar types of modeling, for instance, in reservoir simulations, their fluid simulations of porous media, they can be used for other uh, simulations that are popular in other fields. Um, the genomics that Maxler is responsible for, uh, it's a very hot topic, you know, in doing and perform costs uh, per watt, faster speed of genome sequences. As we know, there's lots of genomes yet to sequence. Uh, and then in Intel um, explored their ray casting library uh, to do <coughs> faster workload processing to meet protected timelines. And so these were the main um, application. And I'll be then focusing on the oil and gas one. So the oil and gas application we picked for this project uh, is part of the Open Porous Media project. Um, it is, um, they have an application inside there known as upscaling. And our contribution, whoops, there uh, has to do with PETSI integration. PETSI is a scientific solver library, provides lots of different solvers, and also AMDX integration. The reason was that the OPM project itself had, was connected to Dune, and uh, my colleague at Statoil was convinced that Dune was the best solver library there was. I said there are other efforts out there like Petsy, and we should look at the, into them and see if we can do it better, uh, especially if we wanted to go to GPU because Dune didn't even support GPU. Uh, and there's some back-end OpenCL uh, code for Petsy uh, right now. Now, of course, since we started, there's also the AMGX integration. We are doing AMGX integration, which is NVIDIA's library that also has a lot of these solvers, especially tuned for CPUs, I mean GPUs. So the application um, calculates upscale permeability. So if you have some, um, at one scale, the permeability, you will need to upscale it to get the whole reservoir. And you need to do it in such a way that you're not losing some of the important data. Um, and you can go uh, to this opmproject.org and you'll find both this application and several other fluid simulation applications. They're open source. Um, yes, they're funded a lot from Statoil. Uh, also Fraunhofer and Sintef are involved. But they have a lot of very useful codes, not only for um, oil and gas, but also that if you need solvers, uh, you know, it hooks into Dune libraries, and if you need fluid simulations, they're worthy a look. 
And like I said, they're all open source, which is one of the few codes in the oil and gas that are open. Because as you may know, Schlumberger and others have huge codes, very good codes, I'm sure, but they're closed. So they're, just, they're not that easy to work with if you want to do research on them. Uh, <coughs> so the uh, use case we said as we're upscaling, uh, we provided both a CPU only and a GPU, CPU uh, extensions, and then we containerized it using Docker. We also have um, another uh, application because the one thing about oil gas, so we was kind of limited to CPU only and CPU GPU, and we don't have implementations and don't want to deal with applications because we're not experts on the Xeon Phi and the DFEs. So, but one thing I found about any vendor machine is these uh, auto tuning libraries for blobs, like basic linear algebra subprograms, right? You can find them, uh, you know, here you can recognize them as Atlas. So just about any machine has a very good implementation of matrix, matrix, multiply, and FFTs, right? I mean, if you think we need an HPC space, they'll be having applications for those. And so, sure enough, we're looking at Atlas, the MKL for Intel, CU BLAS, FFTW, uh, and CU FFT, right? And the nice thing about those libraries and what they have in common is they're out of tune. So they actually not only are just libraries you call, but they actually spin up different versions I mean, they, and try to fit them according to the memory hierarchy, right? And they do a planner, and by doing the planning, they go through, so you'll get very close to hand-coded performance as if you're trying to do a dissembler. And this is very different from just taking a code and porting it and running it right away. And I always teach my students every year, I have this one program we assigned to my parallel computing class that has nothing to do with parallel computing, it's all about optimization. And I challenge them and I pick one of the blah routines, or sometimes an FFT, and try and challenge the students, try to beat this, to, try to beat this piece of code. And only so far I've had two students and I've taught over 10 years this class and about 50 to, or more students a year and only so far two people have been even close or even I think only one actually beat it. So that tells you it's extremely hard to beat these uh, auto-tunable libraries. And I can't emphasize for those who are in publication programming, it's so easy to just write up your own and think you're fine. In fact, I have a little story when I was at UT before I went back to Norway, University of Texas. I had a student come in from the math department, was so proud, he used the numerical recipes, copied in the FFT, uh, and this was the year the FFTW came out, so I, I, we don't blame him. It was, and he said he needed to learn parallelism because it was, the solver was so slow. I told him to try FFTW, he came back the next day, it was 100 times faster, he didn't need to parallelize his code. So it, I can't emphasize how important that is. So the, our bench um, marking in, or testbed environment at NTNU, we have this GPU system. This is a Tesla um, 100 in a Dell uh, server rack. We have a SMP cluster with a NUMA scale, five node. Uh, these are basically a, um, AMD Optron uh, blades, has a total of about three, 600 gigabytes of memory. Uh, we have a mix system that Intel donated to us which is one of the actual older cards, and also a DFE cluster that um, we got donated by Maxler, and also that was a, an older system. Uh, we, we got shipped from Chevron, so I have a suspicion they had it first upgraded, and then we get, you know, universities can't pay f uh, for these big systems uh, just off the bat. But it's very good for uh, testing and showing how, how it, the system works. We also have an OpenStack server cluster provided by our IT department that has an actual OpenStack implementation that uh, implements the SOSUM system that then gets installed from the people over in Ireland. And then our current efforts are to integrate these two. So having applications running on those uh, heterogeneous resources, uh, but then of course managed by the SOSUM system. Um, the software used for this system includes um, Ubuntu, which is a Linux, uh, Slurm, which is our resource manager, especially on the, also used on for the Numiscale resource uh, manager. MPI, I would already mentioned that. It's when you need to use more than one GPU or one, more than one node in the system or any kind of cluster, you, 
you're probably still using MPI. Back when I was an MPI in the early 90s, we modeled ourselves after HPF, thought, you know, they were the greatest, and uh, now people like HTTP what? And the MPI is still around. Who would have known? So I'm kind of proud I've been part of that effort, and it's, maybe I should be embarrassed that it's still, we still haven't come up with anything better, but at least it's involving, right? I mean, they're, they are updating it now. Um, the, here's the solver libraries. The Dune that I, it's mostly developed by Profilhofer. Petsy uh, out of Oregon National Laboratory, but a very, very a community effort, open source. Cusp, you all know from NVIDIA as well as uh, AMGX. Um, the Python is what we use for writing our scripts for Docker. Uh, Marathon's also used as well as EMKV. So now look, look at a little bit how we do this. So um, the plugin for resource registration we, is basically a Python-based plugin that uses PYNVML. And then the, the, uh, that's basically sitting on top of NVIDIA's management library, right? And so, it'll, um, and then that will then call the different GPU resources. So here happens to be some of the ones we have in our, my laboratory. Now, if you want to look at how the actual Python code you lo looks, you have um, NVL in it. You'll see that it, the brand you can say is a generic one, unknown, or you can have you know these are dot dots in between. For instance, you could say set it to be a Tesla, a GeForce, and so on. And then you have uh, the GPU data that you get rid with these uh, NVL commands. And then the, this whole script then will up, output a JSON file, okay? And the JSON file will look like something like this. And you see here, we now, by using these NVL scripts, we've now gotten it populated for a case with a P100 with a product name, PC100 PCI. So that one has a PCI Express. It's not the nice NVLink one. Uh, you can see how the, the, the actual hardware ID uh, and get all the kinds of information. Total memory, blah, blah, blah. So that will actually get uh, a way to get the, the system registered with the cloud service. So the other thing you need if you're going to do cloud servicing is how are you going to pick your resources? Well, one of the things you need to then talk to is the telemetry system. You need to get some information about what the resources utilizations are as far as power and other things that will help you decide what the cloud service would be, right? So a snap, uh, so basing a pl uh, plugin on the snap system. And so we'll set up, have a catalog uh, set up here. Um, and again, you see it's just a script uh, with the versions, setting up some uh, parameters. Then we have the uh, Python-based snap collector where you get, you get to talk to NVML, uh, reads the memory status, temperatures, performance states, utilization, and so on. Um, and then uh, that gets outputted into a telemetry output for the Cloud Lightning, giving you these, uh, this data for that would then go feed into the uh, SOSUM system. So this is sort of the flow from the uh, parameter catalog through the collector through the output. If you want to know more about how you dockerize things, I suggest you go to the 3 p.m. session S7177, which is using containers for GPU accelerated applications. It's actually taught by or uh, given by two people from NVIDIA, John Calmills and Felix Abacassis. And I think that would be, a, if you don't know enough or want to know more, that would be a great place to go. Uh, the current status of the project is that we have the SOSM architecture defined. We have the plugins for resource registration developed, the tested on use cases on the individual platforms, and now working on the integrations, as I mentioned. So what are we doing beyond this? Um, obviously, this project will keep on going until January next year. In the meantime, we'll have Professor Gavin Taylor coming from U.S. Naval Academy to my lab starting in June and spent 14 months with us. He brings with him two cadets. His uh, area of expertise is uh, machine learning and deep learning. And my group has already had a PhD student looking at machine learning techniques for optimizing um, GPU applications because, and, all the, and the GPU CPU applications because you have such massive amount of parameters. Um, the other thing is we have an MCSA postdoc uh, 
Wei Feng Liu is joining my group. And then we're hoping, we, but we haven't gotten yet, a DGX1, we really like one. <laughs> uh, but uh, we do have, I have uh, taught over 35 master's students on GPU computing, I think, and we, I have teaching a course each fall with 50 or more um, students. We'll, be, we'll continue to collaborate with the imaging group, um, and we will continue to get more and better hardware. I just got acquired last fall 60 Jetson TX1s for teaching. We'll operate some of them with TX2s, uh, and we'll, of course, uh, continue in the HPC space as well. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, we have maybe time for one question, and then, and, and if you have time, maybe. Yes, uh, and I'll be around here at the conference, so uh, you could shift me an email. I left my email there, and I can meet you just about anywhere. Thank well, you. great. Anyway, thanks again. Great job. <laughs>